baby. So I just watched Netflix's new Dracula show, and much like Dracula himself, the show left me feeling drained and confused. I call it a show, but you can really watch it in one sitting. It's three hour and a half long episodes, and I would actually recommend watching them, at least the first two. I'm gonna go ahead and go over each episode and all my problems with it. So it's gonna be a fucking wild ride, strap in, spoilers from now on, spoilers from now until the end of time. The first episode I actually like a lot. The show hooks you with some great prosthetics and interesting non-linear storytelling. This is the most interesting the show gets though, so don't get your hopes up. I also want to bring up now that the acting is really good. The guy who does Dracula is doing a great job. He has this intimidating yet condescending and cocky presence. It's so great and it's the only thing that stays good in this whole show. Your employer speaks highly of you, Mr. Parker. Yes, the property has been purchased in your name. Everything is in order. So the first episode follows Jonathan Harker as he is employed by Dracula in a castle. And it's the 1800s. I'm, I'm really bad at this. For the most part, this episode is fine, but it already begins to have some pretty crazy pacing issues. As it cuts back and forth, Dracula is looking younger and Harker is getting weaker. We all understand what's happening, Dracula is drinking Harker's blood. But the fact that we don't know how much time has passed is really jarring. Also, around this point in the show, which is like 20 minutes in, I noticed that the dialogue is really cheesy. Dracula several times says shit like, There's no one living here. Well, you do look rather... drained. You said you didn't drink... wine. Blood? Blood. Crimson, copper-smelling blood. His blood. Blood. Like, I'd be a little more accepting if this wasn't being said by Count fucking Dracula, and this just keeps going throughout the whole show. By the end, I just wanted it to stop. So Harker keeps getting weaker and weaker, and he's also trying to find this girl that's running around the castle. I actually really like these scenes of him exploring the castle. It provides some really good tension, and it really lets the danger that Harker's in sink in. While Harker explores the castle, he finds a room full of zombies that I assume are Dracula's previous victims. This scene's good, I'm only pointing it out because Harker releases one of the zombies, gets attacked by the rest, and one of the zombies is already released, uh, but she's just kind of standing in the corner, and I think it's really funny. And then Harker discovers a prisoner of Dracula. This is where Harker's naivety gets pretty frustrating. I think he's made you his friend. What? He has a really hard time figuring out that this creepy lady is a threat to him until he sees a literal fucking baby corpse in her feeding tube. Once he realizes that she is fucking dangerous, and this is important, he shows her a crucifix to scare her away and she doesn't care. It is the sign of the cross. The symbol of our Lord. I know. It's pretty. This is cool. This is different. It's unique. And Sister Agatha has a great response to this. You assumed, I suppose, that the cross would ward off evil. Your faith. I think it's touching. What happened to yours? I have looked for God everywhere in this world and never found him. Then why are you here? I mean, like many women of my age, I'm trapped in a loveless marriage, maintaining appearances for the sake of a roof over my head. I need you to remember this. I need you to remember this for later. And so at this point, Harker is trying to escape the castle, and he finds himself locked in a box with a fucking vampire baby. And then we're just told that Dracula put a stake in the vampire lady. This is kind of an example of how confusing the pacing is. From the perspective of him telling the story, he passes out, or she drinks his blood, he's in a box, the lady's dead, we're on to something else. Him exploring the castle, trying to find this girl that was wandering around, was all an excuse for him to get in the box, or for her to die. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It doesn't really matter that Dracula killed her, but the fact that none of Harker's efforts meant anything, and that he was just kind of exploring the castle only to be brought to this point, is weird and it's unsatisfying. So Dracula gets Harker out of the box, carries him to the roof, and tells him he's finally going to kill him. He has a few nice lines about how he misses the sun, and it's great. It humanizes him. 
I've heard artists paint her, and poets capture her in words, and Mozart wrote such a pretty little tune, I, I, I really should have spared him, but Johnny, in my memory, she sits behind the second highest peak at this time of year, and she's quite red. Is she red, Johnny? Parker escapes because he leaps off the castle wall after Dracula gets staggered by the crucifix he has. My goodness, that was quick. But this is a really strange scene. Dracula makes a point that the sun is facing a certain direction. Agatha realizes this. The show makes it very clear that his crucifix reflects the sun into Dracula's eyes. There's a, like a fucking spotlight. And when Agatha puts this all together, her conclusion is that God is real after all? Count Dracula fears the cross. He fears the symbol of our Lord. The girl didn't. Uh, never mind the girl, she was nothing. Dracula, prince among vampires, fears the cross. God is an awesome God. I don't mean to turn into a fedora tipping atheist about this, but the cross didn't work on the lady vampire at all, and we do know that Dracula is afraid of the sun because he fucking told us, so why would she assume that the crucifix was the answer and not the reflection of the sun? This leads me to another major problem with the show, they try to make interesting lore or depictions of established Dracula lore, but they do such a terrible job at explaining anything. They try to explain, but it feels like there are 10 people arguing over what the lore should be. This isn't Star Wars, it's Dracula! It's supposed to be simple! Sign my change.org petition to delete me off the face of the earth. And in this scene, they also reveal that Dracula is looking for Harker. I'm not breathing. Sometimes you do, but I think it's mostly habit. You have no heartbeat either. Dead. Undead. But apparently not yet a vampire. This brings the flashbacks to the present, and it alone creates a wonderful sense of immediate tension. Like, holy shit, this fucking powerful, built-up vampire is going to descend on some fucking nuns. And when he does show up, he rips his way out of the stomach of a wolf, and this is the most metal shit I've ever seen. But the tension is immediately deflated when they reveal that Dracula can't enter an area without being invited, which is true to old vampire myths. But the main nun is just kind of fucking with Dracula. They talk about this throughout the episode, but Dracula can learn things about people just from tasting their blood. So he tastes her blood because she's fucking taunting him, which I guess she didn't know this, but if she did, she's kind of stupid because she was just hearing what Harker told her, and she should be able to put that together. Agatha. That's her name, isn't it? Mother Superior used my name, you heard her. You'll have to do better than that. You're from somewhere else, I think. Um, Holland, right? Well, you can tell as much from my accent, I think. I bid you good night. Helsing! Van Helsing! What is your interest in me, Agatha? Van Helsing? Who are you? And that alone is really lame. Why can't she just be a cool new character to Dracula lore? Why does it gotta be someone we know? Why is this Star Wars? Why is this Dracula Star Wars? My biggest problem is that it really doesn't change anything other than undermining the originality of this character's writing. And this scene also kind of fucks with pacing because they just cut to a scene of them in the church. They leave Dracula at the entrance, and now they're in the church, trying to pray the, the, the Dracula away. They should be fucking pouring hot oil from the roof, like they don't know what kills them, but they could just fucking try. Just throw stake spears, he can't fucking come at you, just throw shit at him until he goes away. He's been living hundreds of years with the limitation of needing to be invited in, and yet they think it's fine to just leave him alone. What's stopping you? A feeling? 
A force? Is it physical or mental? Why do you need an invitation? You expect me to tell you? Oh, I don't even expect you to know. I guess we'd never know. So, just to restate, that is something we'll never know. You're not gonna find out later. So while all this is going on, Harker is slowly turning into a vampire. They reveal that the nun who is interviewing him with Sister Agatha is actually his fiance, whose face he forgot. And as the last resort, Harker goes ahead and stabs himself with a stake so he won't kill his fiance. Dracula, being Dracula, knows what's going on somehow and calls up the wall like fucking Spider-Man and then says, Don't you think the undead have tried that? Stay through the heart, that's fine. But someone else needs to put it there. I'm willing to give it a try. All you have to do is invite me in. I guess he's tried it before. But then he could, if he really wanted to die, he could just have somebody else do it. But, or just stand in the sun. Dracula then descends on the nunnery. <clears throat> she was clearing her throat. <laughs> Thing is fine now. As he's in the nunnery, they flash crosses at him and he goes, ah! Oh no, not the cross. Oh, it hurts. And so they confirm that the cross is actually his weakness. And I guess earlier, it was just the double power of the sun and Jesus that scared him away. And if it was both, why didn't Agatha say like, oh, it must have been both. That would help me understand this lore better. <coughs> and wouldn't it have been such a great twist if he goes to a fucking nunnery and they all think crosses are gonna help because Agatha's like, oh, flash your crosses. And then it doesn't? He'd just be like, oh, ha ha, gotcha. You must have thought. Anyway, Dracula kills fucking everybody and then the episode ends. Anyway, episode two. A part of me wants to say that the show actually declines in quality as it goes, but I think episode two is actually a little better than the first one. It doesn't have as many pacing issues, and overall, it doesn't try to establish too much, so it doesn't feel like it's conflicting itself. Not to mention, it's told in an even more non-linear way than the first episode, and it's even better. So it opens up and Dracula and Agatha are playing chess. This is pretty weird because Last we saw, he was about to kill her or something. And so they start having a discussion over a chessboard about what Dracula did after the first episode. He mentions that he books passage for England on a ship called the Demeter. And then we cut introducing some of the new characters for this episode. The captain has a scary dream, the doctor finds a zombie, and then there's a janitor who sees a dead body. As everyone's boarding the ship, we get another couple of character introductions. And this is starting to play out like a game of Clue. Uh, huh, cur curious, that, that's pretty crazy. Then we cut to Dracula. Count Dracula. He meets an old noble woman and he's flirting with her. And then guess what? Murder mystery time! We're a fucking murder mystery ship! It's a little early to say that, but I mean, it's it's what happens. That's why this is my favorite episode of the series. It's a fucking murder mystery, and it's one of my favorite kinds of stories. And it's also really interesting because it's a murder mystery with fucking Dracula. We all know what's happening. But the actual mystery is not what the characters are trying to find out, which is who's killing all the people on the ship. It's when the fuck is this chess game happening that the episode keeps cutting to. So it's a mystery on two fronts, but we know one of the fronts, so it's a mystery on one front. So this whole time they're talking about cabin number nine. Who's in cabin number nine? The captain says it's an invalid, but as more people die, the rest of the passengers get really uneasy and start saying, it's gotta be someone hiding in cabin number nine. Dracula shows up and he says, oh, I figured it out. Look, she's covered in blood and very pale. She must have done it. And oh boy, it's Agatha. The murderer. Oh my God. This is a really fucking cool reveal and I like it a lot, but Agatha is able to talk her way out of the whole situation, even though she's very clearly ill. She says, I'm the vampire. If you hang me, 
uh, I'll come after all of you, even though every time they try to kick the barrel, she goes, Oh no! No! Oh no! Because I am a vampire. No, wait, no. You think that would undermine her argument, but I don't know. I guess they're not paying attention. I wish I wasn't paying attention. She ends up actually convincing them that it's Dracula, that's the vampire. Big surprise, big whoop. But the climax of this episode is actually pretty good. The whole time they're like, where the fuck is Dracula? And he's just slinking around the ship like a scary boy. They come up with a decent plan to fucking burn him alive, and then he just jumps into the water and swims up the side. Because he can, he can crawl like fucking Spider-Man. But then Agatha has the idea to blow up the ship. That way, the ship will never make it to England. But this, I genuinely don't understand. I like this episode a lot, but at the same time, Agatha kind of starts to bug me here. Her plan makes no sense. I know she's still trying to learn about Dracula and vampires in general, but she never brings up the point that he won't be able to swim. And even if she did, her point would be immediately disproven because Dracula gets caught on fire, jumps into the water, swims under the boat, and gets back on the boat. I get her wanting to kill herself somehow, but it still makes no sense to me that you could be a rotting corpse as an undead and still because you drowned it doesn't count? Maybe her idea was the explosion itself would kill Dracula, but there's still water everywhere. Like she didn't get blown to bits, she just drowned. At least that's what I think the implication is. This is gonna seem really out of place, but I need to talk about this because I forgot to mention it when I was initially recording. When Agatha and Dracula are talking because she's trying to stall him so she can blow up the ship without him knowing, they start talking about why Dracula fears the crucifix. And this is one of the very few moments where we get a little insight into how things work, the actual mechanics of the lore. And Dracula says, It's not a symbol of virtue and kindness. It's a mark of horror and oppression. Your idiot church has terrorized the peasant population for centuries, and I have been imbibing the blood of those same peasants for so long, I have absorbed their fear of the cross. That's actually a really cool interpretation of why a vampire would fear a cross. Not because it's holy, but because he understands all of the people's fear and it resonates within him. I like that a lot. But then Agatha just goes, no. Sorry? No, I mean, that's all very nice and logical, but that's not the reason. She just says, no, fucking Uno reverse card. I don't think so. Like, what the fuck? Why would he lie? He knows that he's about to kill you. Even he's fucking confused about it. Anyway, she ends up blowing the ship up. We think it's all fine and dandy, but Dracula got into his box of soil to regenerate. He swims on out, gets onto the beach, He's in London. Oh man, there's a spotlight. Oh fuck, he's in real life New York City. He popped through the sewer like fucking Smurfs. Something old or mythical coming to real life is a really old and overdone trope. Even if it wasn't, even if it wasn't, this would still be kind of lame. And don't get me wrong, when I first saw this, I laughed because it's hilarious, but I was also like, oh, that's cool. But part of me also feels like the series just should have ended here, or ended with Dracula walking up to a highway and being like, oh, what's this? Not only because it's really kind of tacky to have modern day Dracula, but also because it took me about five seconds to realize exactly what they were going to do. Dracula gets surrounded by cars, and out comes another Agatha, but it's her descendant. We all knew it was coming. We all knew. But now she has a British accent. That's that's a nice touch. Also, I should mention that some of the editing choices are kind of bizarre. When Dracula first encounters Zoe, she gets this weird like distortion effect, and I, I don't know. That was that was just weird. All right, episode three is where shit gets weird, wet, wild, and stupid. The third episode opens and Dracula's fucking around. I'm gonna be straight with you. This little episode is linear. It's boring. It's confusing. It sucks. Because the other two episodes have been non-linear, the show has a habit of taking something and not explaining it right away because you're being told the story from two perspectives. This episode also does kind of weird shit without explaining, but there's not another perspective to learn it from, so you just have to be like, oh, I guess I'll learn about that later. Which is way less interesting. And maybe it's because of the contrast of this episode and the other two, but I like this way less. The third episode opens and Dracula's fucking around in modern day England. Your immediate thoughts are, how did he escape? What happened? I don't know, I guess he ran away. I don't care. This is like the only part of the episode that I like, by the way. Dracula wakes up a random lady. She goes, oh, did you bring my husband home from the pub? And he's like, sure. And then it's revealed that he fucking tucked him into the fridge. And there's one line that I like. Bob. What? 
What have you done to my fridge? Is the fridge the white box? Yeah. Pops in the fridge. That's kind of badass, and I like that. But also, he should know what a fridge is, because he drank Bob's blood. He goes off about how this kind of shitty house is a castle, and he's watching a, like a Nat Geo special in Africa where he gets to see the sun without actually being burnt by it. That's really cool. These are cool ways to have a fucking mythical character in a modern day setting without it being over the top and stupid Smurfs 3D movie action. It's also kind of interesting that Dracula is almost acting animalistically. He just goes for somebody, puts them in a fucking fridge like he had the other people in the boxes in the castle. What the fuck is that for? I don't know. He calls them their brides. Uh, I don't know. He said he was gonna keep the baby, but then he got on a ship. He didn't bring the baby. The baby's probably dead. And that's another big problem that I have with this show. Dracula doesn't have like super clear motives. He just kind of wants to kill people. And they don't portray him as like animalistic. They portray him as very calculated. He compares people to wine vintages. But he doesn't really have a plan. Later on in this episode, they call it world domination. You came to me with a, a program, a plan, some genuinely fresh initiatives for, well, let's call it what it is, world domination. But they, he never says that. He never says he wants to take over the world. I feel like that would be incredibly hard for Dracula to do by himself. I don't know, maybe if he ate a world leader and then was like, now I'm the world leader. I don't think you can do that though, I don't think that's legal. Plus, how hard would it be for someone to dominate the world when half the world is daytime? Anyway, the only other thing I like about this episode is that they fucking smash this house with a bulldozer. That's really cool. Zoe shows up and is like, hey Dracula, get in this box. He's like, I don't want to get in the box. And she's like, well fuck you, get in the box. And he's like, no, I'm gonna drink your blood. And then he starts vomiting everywhere and she's like, oh Jesus, you need a fucking Tums pal? Anyway, Dracula gets in the box, they take him away. And now we're introduced to, I'm gonna be real with you, I don't remember this fucking character's name. I'm just gonna call him Skinny White Dude. Skinny White Dude goes to a club and it's very obvious he has a crush on this girl. He's like, oh, I want to date this girl. And she's like, I just want hookups, blah, blah, blah. And the whole time, I just want to know what the fuck happened to Dracula. Why did he vomit blood? What's happening? And I got to watch this fucking teen drama shit. This ain't Degrassi British version. It's Dracula. Anyway, skinny white dude has a fucking conversation with Chud. He's like, oh, I don't really want to date this girl. And he's like, man, wow, what a douchebag. And then uh, he proposes to her. Why? I don't know. This character, I don't even know if he has a name in the story. Anyway, they prattle on for literally 10 minutes about this fucking love triangle story. And then they go into why this character is important. So skinny white dude is actually a blood donor for the organization that just took Anna. Dracula. And this is another thing that is just so weird and useless. They bring up this whole blood donor thing. There's a fucking room full of blood donors. The only thing I can assume is that they're blood donors so Dracula can eat while he's in captivity. They say a little later that they want to feed him and be civil about him being studied and, and, and researched. But they never say what the blood donors are for. They never say. They sit them all down in a meeting and they're like, hey, we got Dracula. And, and that's it. And that's it. He has the weakest excuse for being a part of the story. And I hate Skinny White Dude. Also, when Skinny White Dude goes into the blood donor orientation, they, he, they're like, another um, negative, I see. And someone goes, been Imagine being made fun of for your blood type. What the fuck does that even mean? And one more thing, it makes no sense that they're in these weird jumpsuits if they're just blood donors. They could come in twice a week and just be like, here you go, here's some blood. Anyway, see you later. Like, I guess they have to feed them certain things to test on, like, the effect that it has on Dracula. Maybe they're living there. I would love to know, but the show doesn't tell me. They were more concerned about the fucking love triangle that Skinny White Dude is in than why his actual relation to Dracula. <laughs> anyway, the next scene, is, uh, Zoe comes in to get some blood from Dracula, and they have some banter, whatever. Dracula goes, Did you say rights? You'll get the hang of it. No, no, no. Please try and explain. I missed an entire century. What are 
rights. N nobody has rights, Zoe. Man, woman, or monster. No one, nowhere. It's just a lunatic fantasy. And then immediately his lawyer comes in and his lawyer says, Count Dracula has rights. How did he get a lawyer, you ask? Well, they gave him an iPad so he can read books. Why not give him books? I, I, I don't, I don't know. They're like, oh, it's all the books in the world. And then he guesses the Wi-Fi password because it was Dracula, and he Skypes with a lawyer telling him that he's being wrongfully held in this facility. Why did they give him an iPad? Why didn't they just give him books? Anyway, because it's actually illegal to hold somebody and say they're a vampire, he's freed by this lawyer man. And this is the point where it's like, how seriously is the show actually taking itself? At first it seems very serious and very gritty with like a few jokes, a few cheesy lines, sure. Now it's like something out of fucking Goosebumps. And so Dracula steals skinny white dude's phone on his way out. And just like that, what we thought was going to be an X-Files-esque show where they research the paranormal now turns into cheesy fucking bullshit. And it just all goes down from here and we're barely halfway into the episode. The entire blood donor thing is just dropped. That becomes entirely irrelevant because now Dracula is free and about. And now Dracula has skinny white dude's phone, which he now uses to sext the girl who just got engaged. And the most frustrating part for me is that this could have been done in a way that made more sense. They introduced the blood donors. They introduced skinny white dude and his love interest. The whole point of it all was so Dracula could be free and contact skinny white dude's love interest. But we know that Dracula learns things from drinking people's blood. We could have had a cute character moment where Dracula keeps drinking different people's blood and being like, oh, I know this about this guy, I know this about this guy. And then when he drinks skinny white dude's blood, he finds this figure that is constantly on his mind who's like an interesting person to Dracula. And then he's like, oh, that's interesting. Now I know about this person. That would at least somewhat include the whole blood donor shit. But no, they just drop, they just drop it because now Dracula's got a fucking cell phone. I realize I haven't talked about what little attention Zoe's got in this episode. So I'll go over it as fast as I can because this shit's about to get just bonkers. So Dracula started throwing up when he drank Zoe's blood at the beginning of the episode. When Zoe comes in to get some of Dracula's blood, he goes, I've sampled a split up bouquet before, and these days I believe you call it cancer. So she wanders around pondering her life for a minute, and then she fucking drinks Dracula's blood because she thinks that's what's gonna cure her. I, I think, I think that's what she thinks. I think that's what she thinks. It could also be that because Dracula bit her, now she is technically a vampire, so she can learn things from drinking people's blood, or is that just a Dracula thing? Because they say that Dracula is the only one of the vampires who's not, like, feral? So I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I do not know. This show doesn't tell me anything. <laughs> Please, can I just have a crumb? of story. So a time lapse happens that's incredibly vague and I don't know how much time has passed. Dracula's working out and he says, I've never had to work out before. So I don't know why he's doing it now. And they reveal that Dracula and Engaged Girl have been hooking up for blood suckling sessions. That's right, your girl's a freak. Dracula takes Engaged Girl to a cemetery where he explains that some people just don't die. They mentioned this in the first episode. Some people, when they die, they're fully conscious and they're aware of their body rotting. This makes very little sense when they try to start expanding on it. Because they go to a graveyard and he goes, listen close, and you can hear people banging on their coffins and screaming. What does it sound like? Knocking. Knocking, yes. On a coffin lid. From the inside. So I guess they're they're dead or they're asleep and then they bury them and then they wake back up, I guess. When Dracula bites Harker, he says Harker came back really fast because he came back right away. But that was a vampire bite. That was I don't imagine all of these people were bitten by vampires. Dracula also mentions that children will wriggle out of their coffins, and I find that very hard to believe. <laughs> they are six feet under the ground and in a wooden box. But anyway, they have a creepy prosthetic child, and it's very creepy. It's very scary. And Engage Girl just thinks that that's cool, I guess. Can you see me? No, 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 no. Play with him. He'll 
to follow you home. Would you really? Anyway, they do some blood sucking, and the only other scene that I like in this whole episode happens. My lord. Engaged girl is discovered by her friend. She's brought back home to recover from acute blood loss. And skinny white dude is there to visit. And then he gets a call to go visit Zoe, who is also dying in a bed. I just, I don't know. I just think it's funny that he, he just goes from one person in a bed to another person in a bed in like a minute and a half. Then they show that the little kid followed engaged girl home. And, and Dracula says this. Please avert your eyes. I am. Um... I have to murder a child. And then Dracula finally finishes her off and kills her for good. Or does he? This is the most explanation that we get about how being undead works. Because she's dead for real, but she in the mirror is alive. So it's like her soul or whatever is still alive. So they have a funeral for her and the guy she was engaged to is just like comical. Fucking looking at his watch and he has a luggage. Also, his luggage is just tagged already, and that doesn't usually happen until you actually check it. So I don't, I don't know what's that, what that's all about. But we keep cutting back to views inside the coffin of Engaged Girl freaking out because she's in a coffin. Obviously, her real body is dead, but her spirit or soul or whatever is freaking out because she's dead. And so they cremate her because that was her wish in life, uh, which means her soul experience is being burnt alive. Dracula mentions this earlier, and he says, don't, don't have them do that, because it hurts really bad. Which makes sense, I guess, if a soul can feel pain. And like I mentioned before, the whole undead thing doesn't make a lot of sense to me. I guess you're just asleep for a while, but your soul is alive, and then after a certain point of time, they reconnect, and now you're able to walk around again. But before the show reveals that, it starts cutting back from Zoe and Agatha, because I... I guess because she drank Dracula's blood and Agatha had her blood drank by Dracula that Zoe could now connect with Agatha because their DNA matches. That's the most I can make sense of this. I'm really trying. So basically, Agatha just tells Zoe, I'll just kill Dracula. And Zoe's like, what should I do? And Agatha's like, I, I don't know, just do it. These three things must be one thing. So what does Dracula fear? I don't know. Or what does he want then? I don't know. Correct. Now, think, think, think. What does he want and what does he fear? I don't know. I don't care. It's not my problem anymore. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I have no <laughs> fucking clue what you just said, but hell yeah, man. I'm going to speak my truth. But fair enough. Zoe then calls Skinny White Dude and says, hey, take me to Dracula's house. We, I guess, know where it is, and now we're having a final confrontation. And I mean it, Zoe just knows where it is. She goes, oh, you, it's not near a church. Finding you wasn't difficult. A man of your breeding and ego is temperamentally incapable of hiding. One just looks for an unnecessarily tall building, multiple exits, and no view of a church. And while the three of them are having a discussion about how much they don't like each other, the doorbell rings, and what do you know, it's Engaged Girl. This is the last thing I like about the show, and it's how long they take their time revealing what the fuck she looks like after being cremated. Because the prosthetic work in the show has been great, and this is gonna be like the magnum opus, and they show her in the reflection is looking normal, and it's great, and when they reveal it, it's fucking terrifying. But the way they reveal it, I really don't like. In Engaged Girl's mind, she still thinks she's beautiful because all she can see is her reflection, which looks normal. And I guess because she's undead, she is crazy and is obsessed with her vanity all of a sudden. But she looks in the reflection, she sees a pretty girl, she's like, great, that's that's good. And Zoe goes, You're so beautiful, Lucy. Why don't you take a selfie? You smell funny. She's dying. It's almost like some like older person wrote something a millennial would say. It's just so weird. Because you could have just taken a picture of her and then shown it to her. Why does she have to take a selfie? And she gets into this like sexy pose. It's so... 
Engaged girl starts to panic because she realizes she looks like a fucking meatball, and skinny white dude says, I'll go ahead and put a stake through your heart. He kisses her first, and that shit makes me fucking gag, and then he kills her. And I really can't help but think that this whole story arc involving skinny white dude and engaged girl, like, this whole section of the show could really just be removed. All we care about is Zoe and Dracula, but this whole story arc served to introduce these characters and then kill them. They don't really have an arc, nothing really changes. It just kind of starts and ends. If you wanted to make the point that it's like Dracula rips through people's lives, you'd need more episodes to do that, I would argue. And then Zoe goes, all right, so you've served your purpose in the story. Now please leave, skinny white dude. I'm gonna kill Dracula. And then I shit you not, the funniest part of the show happens. Well, how did it taste? How did what taste? <laughs> Dr. Elzing, I think you drank my blood. This is like so anticlimactic. She just fucking goes for it. Like, I get it. You would want to take him off guard and pull the drapes down. I understand that. But usually, there'd be a little more cinematic tension. There'd be a music buildup. There'd be some, uh, you know, cinematic, like a shot to be like, oh, it's a tracking shot. You see her look at the drapes and, you know, you see her hands clench and you hear her heartbeat racing or something to imply that she's about to move, but she just goes from completely static to running on the table, and Dracula just lets it happen? He just kind of watches, and the fact that the fucking intense music kicks in at that ex as soon as she starts running, it just fucking kills me. It's like this nice somber tune, and then... And even though she runs, on this fucking long ass table. Dracula doesn't have the sense to get out of the way of the drapes. Not to mention, why wouldn't Dracula have blackout curtains? Those are the shittiest drapes for someone who is sensitive to the sun. That makes I have darker fucking curtains and blinds than Dracula does. When Zoe pulls down the drapes, Dracula starts burning. Oh no, I'm melting. Oh god. And the music is so dramatic and it's fucking, he's dying. We did it. But then he's like, wait. What? It don't hurt. And then it's revealed that Dracula isn't actually weak to the sun. These aren't curses. They are merely habits that become fetishes, that become legends that even you believe. This makes no sense. It's like they try to undersell something being mythical. And you know what? I would 100% buy this. I would be 100% for this. If Dracula didn't also have the power to climb walls like Spider-Man and rip himself out of the belly of wolves. If Dracula wasn't already a powerful, otherworldly being. If they didn't establish that there are undead in this universe, then Dracula being in reality powerless is an interesting concept. But they really just established that Dracula has no weakness. Dracula just doesn't like the sun, and he grew to hate it because he didn't want to be seen as who he really was. He can't look in a mirror because he can't stand himself. He doesn't like the cross because he can't die. Now we know why this works. <sighs> because it speaks of the courage you long to possess. The courage it takes to die. Dracula's lust for power doesn't seem like it was the result of his lack of courage. Dracula wanted power because he was a vampire, because he, I don't know, he was a dom, fuck it. I like canon like Castlevania, where Dracula is fucking depressed. He doesn't want to be immortal. He wants to die, but he doesn't have the courage, or he doesn't have the ability to let go of his pride, or he's fucking too vengeful, or whatever it may be. That's not what we see in this show. This Dracula is cocky, he's powerful, he doesn't give a fuck, he views humans as fucking wine and livestock. He does not have any sympathy. But right now, in the last five minutes of the show, it goes, well, actually, Dracula, I know you're just sad. And the show in the 
beginning of this episode. They show Dracula looking in the mirror and seeing his true form. The old, old count that he would be if he wasn't drinking blood and regaining his youth. And he punches the mirror because he hates that view of himself. And that makes sense to me. He hates seeing himself old because he's vain. Not because he's not courageous enough to come to terms with who he really is, because Dracula seems to love who he is. He seems to love his fucking own character traits. He just doesn't want to be old. I don't know, man. This show fucking sucks. He drinks Zoe's blood. They die together on the table. My final point is this. Right before Dracula drinks Zoe's blood and kills himself, he looks up at the sun and weeps because he's missed the sun. He wants to see the sun, but he was scared and that's what made him feel like it was burning him before. I guess that's what they're trying to say. But if he wanted to see the sun so badly, then why was he afraid of it? I think they're trying to imply that he didn't want to be seen in the daylight because he would have to come to terms with who he was and be open with himself and it's almost a metaphor kind of thing. But I think that this is stupid because he would be alone, he would just come out in the day on his castle and try to look at the sun! Anyway, that's it. That's Dracula. We did it. The first two episodes of the show are actually pretty good. When I first started writing this review, I was a lot harder than I should have been. In the process of rewatching it, I came to actually quite enjoy the first two episodes. Watch it for yourselves, it's on Netflix, it's only three episodes, and please feel free to uh, like and subscribe. Thanks for watching. Goodbye. Six out of ten. Watch Castlevania instead.